Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, bonjour. I understand it's been a long day, right? Believe me, I almost forgot what I was supposed to talk about, actually. Anyway, uh, I'm from Bhutan, and uh, before I start my talk, I would just love to uh, start off with uh, asking everyone here a question. Uh, with a raise of hands, please. How many of you here heard about Bhutan? Surprising, really. I thought there will be no hands you know, going up in the air, but really, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased to see so many rains, uh, hands going up in the air. Anyway, uh, like I said, I come from Bhutan, and uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, a story on gross national happiness that we have adopted in Bhutan uh, as a development approach. So as you can see on, uh, on the slides, uh, I'll be talking on how we operationalize the concept of gross national happiness back in my country. Uh, before I begin on what gross national happiness is all about, I would just like to give you all a brief background about you know, how the, uh, the idea of gross national happiness got conceived in Bhutan. You know, uh, the picture you see in the, uh, on, on, on the slide up there is the fourth king of Bhutan, actually, the, fa uh, the father of the present king. Uh, you know, actually, I wasn't expecting any hands to go up in the air that time because Bhutan actually exposed to the outside world rather late, very late actually. And you know, uh, it, on the hindsight just now when we look back, it proved to be an asset for us because as wise as our king is, we got to learn a lot from you know, uh, the neighboring countries who opened up to the world uh, rather early. And you know, we got to sort of copy you know, the best practices uh, and also sort of uh, keep away the, the, the negative things that you know, uh, con the countries actually experienced. So development as we know, our king realized that you know, development as we know is not catering to the need of our people. So after he became king in the early 1970s, he happened to be traveling through you know, uh, one of the airports in India and uh, some journalists came to him asking, uh, asking him about uh, Bhutan and asking about you know, his country and I don't know, one of the journalists happened to ask him, so what's the GDP of your country? That's when uh, His Majesty made this paradigm shifting statement and he said, GNH is more important than GNP for my country. So this is how the idea of G gross national happiness got conceived in Bhutan. <laughs> now, what is GNH? Okay, before we go on to answer this question, I think you know earlier this morning, uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz says something like, you know, if you measure the wrong thing, you will get the wrong answers, right? And uh, I think he went on to indicate that uh, measuring GDP is not the right thing. So. You know, we are in absolute agreement with what Professor Joe uh, Stiglitz had to say, because of which we adopted uh, gross national happiness as a measure of progress for our country. And uh, this is not to say that gross national happiness is opposed to GDP. After all, you know, uh, when we are hungry, when we don't have enough to eat or enough to wear or things like that, we need income from economic growth to alleviate these issues, right? So GNH is not opposed to GDP, but we like to, uh, according to the GNH paradigm, we just like to consider GDP as just one of the parameters. We don't, we consider G GDP approach as a means to uh, achieve something more important, achieving uh, something more important, and, and perhaps that could be happiness. So that's how you know, uh, we had uh, actually uh, adopted GNH as our development uh, philosophy, and it is nothing actually. It's basically to say that you know, if you want to achieve happiness in life, you, know, you have to have a balanced approach. Therefore, GNH is defined as a multidimensional development approach that seeks to achieve a harmonious balance between material well-being, with uh, that of the spiritual, emotional, and cultural needs of our society. So basically, it's about striking a balance, you know, that in life, as we strive for uh, wealth, as we strive for status, things like that, we do not forget that there are other things that contributes to your happiness, other than material wealth. And uh, it's interesting to note that we have also adopted happiness, gross national happiness as end objective of our development. Because 
Our vision and philosophy is based on the simple premise that happiness is ultimately uh, the desire of every human being in this world. Well, I don't know if did 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 any one of you you know actually sit back and give it a thought that you know what you actually aspire from life you know a Porsche you know a SUV a building things like that you know material wealth do you think that's like the end objective that you really aspire from life well you know give it a thought later on when you have time but just now I think we we have to rush on anyway it is based on you know the fact that the ultimate desire of every human being is happiness therefore the government. in you know what we're calling development you know uh, we have to identify areas that contributes towards happiness of the people that areas that are critical uh, in determining human happiness and create enabling conditions around those areas so that our people have the opportunity to extract the maximum happiness out of you know uh, whatever uh, the thing we call development our uh, king believes that you know uh, through development we can have built so many schools in the country so many roads in the country hospitals in the country but at the end if our people are not happy then basically we really have not achieved the objective of our plan uh, uh, of our development so that's what we believe now how did we actually operationalize the concept of gross national happiness well uh, as i said earlier the idea of gross national happiness existed since the early 1970s but the actual operationalization could begin only in 2008 that is because we did we did not have uh, anything like indicators to measure it and without having something to measure it we will not be able to manage it right so it took a lot of time in actually uh, developing the indicators and we have uh, uh, an organization called the center for bhutan studies which is really the think tank you know uh, we consider it the think tank and they are really the architects behind this philosophy of gross national happiness so uh, they in consultation with uh, the uh, experts around the world the economists uh, so many economists uh, so many bright minds around the world in consultation with them they came up with happiness indicators they developed a happiness index and they also carry out the what we call gnh survey so after having done all that the actual operationalization began in 2008 and in 2008 with the help of these experts uh, and uh, it, based on the instruction of the government three significant things actually uh, were in- introduced in the country firstly like i said gnh indicators were developed and uh, the gnh uh, policy screening tool was developed and uh, the gnh indicators me i work at the gnh commission now the gnh indicators we use it like you know we use it as a dashboard indicator actually we use, you, we look at these indicators you know to to see like what areas in the country are doing well what areas are not doing so well which part of the country is doing well which part of the country is not doing well you know we we use it like a dashboard indicator to give us to draw attention to those areas that needs to be addressed so therefore when we go on to address those areas that are lagging behind we basically uh, go on to allocate resources therefore it becomes a basis for al- uh, allocating resources as well and we also have what we call a gnh screening tool that's basically a tool that you know we use it like a lens to look at our policies so that to ensure that you know uh, all our policies are gnh friendly and our policy uh, also to ensure that our policies doesn't have any adverse effect on uh, variables or uh, so called elements of uh, gnh and of course uh, like i said the gross national happiness commission is the com- uh, is, is the office where uh, in in which i work is been established in order to mainstream the elements of gnh into our plans and programs we are really a planning body actually we we make the plans we identify the national priorities and allocate resources and do all these sort of things and in the process we have been you know uh, uh, entrusted with the uh, the the job of mainstreaming the elements of gnh into our plans and programs and thirdly now having said that you know we have embarked on the journey of gnh adopted the approach and also adopted gnh as the as our end objective of uh, development we need to ensure that we are on the track we, we are on the track that we have embarked on so in order to do that we carry out this gnh survey every 3 years to make sure that we are not deviating from you know the the objective that uh, that uh, that we are headed uh, towards and that we are on the right we are on the right track now uh if you if you look at the slide 
you know, this is basically what the uh, GNH framework is all about. When we say that, you know, uh, uh, GNH approach or things like that, this is really the framework that makes up the GNH approach, actually. And if you look at it, you can see the conventional dimensions like health, education, good governance, ecological diversity, living standards. These are some of the parameters which, which every government around the world, you know, as far as I know, uses you know, uh, in, in their decision making, in, in developing policies, so on and so forth. But if you look at it carefully, what the, new, what the GNH uh, outlook has added into this, uh, into this framework is the things like uh, psychological well-being, as you can see as PWB up there is psychological well-being, things like time use, things like culture, things like community vitality. We have added these aspects into our development framework because we have identified that these are critical determinants of human happiness. Whatever government does, whatever actions or inactions government takes are not neutral to these aspects. In fact, if you really analyze, you know, these are the areas which uh, the unintended consequences of development uh, really falls on things like, you know, you have uh, growing cities and, you know, growing populations, but side by side, you know, uh, there is growing loneliness. You know, that's the paradoxical situation that I'm sure we all know about, you know. And uh, the other, other example is, you know, the countries are very, uh, being, getting developed, wealth are being increased, but on the other hand, there is, you know, uh, inequalities that's, you know, growing bigger and bigger on, uh, on, on the other hand. So that's why we've identified that, you know, if we are to achieve happiness through what we call development, we have to take care of these aspects, things like psychological well-being, time use, culture, and community vitality. Well, I do not have time to explain, you know, the importance of each one of these, but let me give you an example of just one of these. Let's look at psychological well-being. By psychological, we basically are, uh, are talking about our, our mental health, you know. Uh, we need to nurture the mental health of us as, as much as we nurture the physical side, you know, through exercising and things like that. And some of the powerful tools to enhance our uh, psychological well-being are things like, you know, meditation, things like saying prayers. I'm sure there are a lot of you who practice meditation here. Yeah, so, you know, uh, it, it, you know I, I'm sure I don't need to uh, pronounce the, the benefits that, you know, uh, someone can actually, you know, uh, get out of uh, things like uh, meditation. You know, uh, to this end, as a, as, a, as a measure in order to enhance the psychological well-being of the Bhutanese people, we have introduced an initiative called Educating for GNH. And under that particular program, one thing I can tell you as an example is we have introduced meditation in all the schools in Bhutan. So now all the schools in Bhutan, they start the day with two to three minutes of meditation in the morning and ends the day with two to three uh, minutes of meditation at the end of the day. So this is, you know, uh, one example that I can tell you about. And of course, like, you know, uh, whatever government does, whatever policies that government introduces should not also affect, you know, uh, how people use their time. There should be a proper balance of uh, how people use their time between leisure, sleep and work. So if, there's a, if there isn't a balance in how you use your time, you know, uh, you, you cannot expect to be happy in the long run. So this is how we, you know, uh, sort of uh, take care of these aspects while making policies, while making decisions, so on and so forth. Now, why gross national happiness? Again, coming back to what Professor Stickler said, is in line with that again. You know, we, we, we have to understand that, you know, uh, GDP is biased towards uh, production and cons uh, consumption, right? Uh, GDP, you know, induces people to produce more, earn more, so that they can consume more. But when we talk about, you know, uh, continued production and things like that, we're talking about, you know, uh, basically uh, using our natural resources. But we have to remember that we live in a world where natural resources are not growing anymore. There's only you know, so much of natural resources that we can exploit. So we, we, we need to you know, strike a balance. You know? We need to think about the future generations that are going to come into this world. You know, our natural resources are not going to grow. So, you know, uh, just to give you a very simple example, you know, we have a saying in Bhutan, which I would like to literally translate it in English. If you have a cow, let me, okay, let, me, let me just throw this question. If you have a cow, what would you prefer to do with it? You know, sell the cow or milk the cow? 
you know, in in in, in our Bhutanese saying, basically, you know, the the saying goes like, if you own a cow, it's better to milk the cow and reap the benefits as opposed to selling the cow or killing the cow, selling it as beef. You know, that's because you know, if you sell the cow or if you kill the cow and sell the you know the sell sell the beef, your bank account might just increase overnight. You know, your GDP will grow over the roof, you know, overnight. Fine, but how long is that going to last? I don't think that's going to last for long. But as opposed to doing that, if you actually milk the cow and reap the benefits, you may not become rich overnight, you know. But you will have enough to eat, enough to live by, sustain, you know, for a long period of time. So, in my opinion, that's uh, you know a, the basic difference between the GDP and the GNH approach. Now, you know, what has the GDP uh, approach done today? What has the development as we today has done? You know, the situation of the contemporary world that we live in. You know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama had written a poem that specifically describes the kind of world, the contemporary world that we live in today. And uh, I, I took the liberty to actually put that poem uh, on my slide and I'll be uh, happy to read it out to everyone here. Well, it goes, you know, we have bigger houses, but small families. We have more convenience, but less time. We have more experts now, but we have more problems. More medicines, but less healthiness. We have been all the way to the moon and back. But we have trouble crossing the street to meet our new neighbor. We have built more computers to hold more information, but we have less communication. We have become long on quantity, but really short on quality. Steep profits but shallow relationships. It's time when there is much in the window, but really nothing in the room. So this describes succinctly, you know, uh, the kind of contemporary world that we live in. And I thought, you know, uh, it, it really described the, you know, uh, the, the, the reliability, uh, no, not reliability, the relevance of the GNH approach in, in, in the current, uh, situ uh, current situation. So perhaps, you know, uh, in the history of mankind, it is time now that uh, we look for a different approach other than GDP that is more uh, sustainable. You know, uh, Bhutan has adopted happiness Precisely because, you know, researchers have shown now that, you know, happy people are more healthy, they live longer. Happy people can, uh, are able to use their skills and abilities at a much higher level as opposed to unhealthy people. You know, uh, healthy, people's, have, healthy people are more immune to diseases and even if they fall sick, they have the tendency to recover very fast. Healthy people are said to be less prone uh, into involving themselves into uh, violent acts of violence and you know antisocial behaviors. All in all, healthy people, happy people contribute not only uh, to their own well-being, but they contribute a lot to the well-being of the society at large. Well, when we talk about happiness or gross national happiness is not to say, and you know, I'm not standing in front of you today to say that we in Bhutan have achieved happiness. No. We are a very, you know, we, we are a small country situated between, you know, uh, two giants between, uh, with China in the north and uh, India in the south. If you, if you look at the world map, you're hardly visible. And we are a developing country. We have a lot of issues of poverty. We have people with, you know, uh, who do not have adequate uh, food to eat, adequate clothes to wear. But what, you know, uh, sets us aside from the rest of the world is that we have been bold enough, bold enough to take on happiness as our development objective and we have been bold enough to approach life with happiness in mind. And perhaps, 
if every one of us in the world can think along a similar line like this, perhaps then we can maybe make the world a better place to live, not just for ourselves, but for our future generations as well. Thank you very much.